Mr. Buffett, Mr. Gates. My name is Antoinette Genovese. I'm a first-year executive MBA student, and I actually work at Goldman Sachs. So thank you for your investment. <laughs> Why aren't you at work? <laughs> One of my favorite lines from you is you want to hire the guy with the IQ of 130 that thinks it's 120, and the guy with an IQ of 150 who thinks it's 170 will just kill you. You must be thinking about Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> Can you do any better on salary? Unfortunately, that range is set at corporate. What about mileage when I use my car? I mean, gas ain't cheap, you know. <laughs> we think that 25 cents a mile is pretty generous. How about 27? And, uh, when I make long distance calls, will they be monitored or is it on the honor system? But if you ever wondered what the billionaire next door keeps in his wallet, well, now's the time to ask. I won't show you everything. I guess I've got about maybe $600 in here. Here's a $50 bill from a bank we owned in Rockford, Illinois. And if you look at it, down at the bottom, it's signed by the fellow who ran the bank for me. They issued their own currency. So I carry that around for good luck. And uh, here we have my McDonald's card, which lets me eat free at any McDonald's in Omaha for the rest of my life. So that's why the Buffett family has Christmas dinner at McDonald's. That explains a lot of things. <laughs> Does anybody else have one of those cards? Uh, there's just a few of them. Bill Gates has one. His is good throughout the world, I guess. But mine is only good in Omaha, but I never leave Omaha, so mine's just as good as his is. <laughs> Doesn't have one. Well, uh, I, I, I think I think um, President Clinton wanted one very badly, but I don't think he has one. I think he has to go to McDonald's with me. <laughs> Here's one from Johnny Rockets, which is a, a place I like very much. I like the milkshakes there, and the uh, I like the music there. And this lets me take the three guests with me, actually. Uh, uh, so so play up to me, and maybe someday you'll get to go to Johnny Rockets with me. And let's see what else we have. Got a few credit cards. There, and really, there's not a whole lot more here. There's a driver's license, and as you can see, the billfold is about 30 years old. It, it's only been out a few times during that period. I, it, 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 often laws come out when I pull out my billfold. <laughs> well, when you found Ben Graham, he was unconventional, and he was very smart, and. Of course, that was very attractive to you. And then when you found out it worked and you could make a lot of money while you sitting on your ass, of course, you were an instant convert. And, and, and so... It still the, appeals to me, actually. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> so. Well, actually, Joe, I, I, I thought instead, you know, you've always wanted a share of NetJets. I've got a NetJets tie here, and instead of giving you an eight, I'm going to take this. There's dozens of planes on this. And I'm going to give this to Becky to take back to you. Wow. You, you are now a, a major net. I mean, Here we go, Joe. Yeah, a exactly. Here we are. Thousands dozens, of jets dozens, that I'm getting a tie. All right. Dozens, dozens of planes. Right. Dozens of planes on it. Well, nice thank Warren. you very okay. much for your time today. Thank you. We appreciate thank it. You, thank you. He would come to board meetings and bring with him 20 annual reports. And he would take me through these annual reports, saying this is a good business, this is a cash-intensive business, this is a utility, this is why you should be interested in this. And I mean, it was like going to business school with him, and he, it was really wonderful because he was such a good teacher. Finally, he sent me the back of a Disney annual report, and there was a kid on it in a stroller, and he was like that. And he said, this is you, this is you after the 20th annual report. <laughs> and he had the patience to do this. I mean, not many people would have they would have just taken one look at this idiot and gone the other way, but it really saved my life. Two of the biggest investors sold their stock. And um, Warren told me, they were friends of his, and he said that they were gonna sell. And this, I mean, I've, I have to confess to you in, and I know that nobody will tell anybody. <laughs> uh, that, that I thought it was the end, that I'd messed it up, and I burst into tears. You're not supposed to do that, but I did. And uh, so we were talking many years afterwards about, and he said, don't be silly, Wall Street has never really um, 
appreciates. Um, valuable stocks until they get up, and then it's too late. But that's Wall Street, and you, you don't let it upset you. And I did. So anyway, we were recalling this incident many years later, and um, he said, and he said, well, just buy in their stock. And so we bought in stock, which nobody was doing then. They did it later, but, um, and we bought in the stock. And he said, well, he said, we made about $300 million off that. And he said, next time you burst into tears, call me first. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about Tesla? Its founder is bold and brilliant and swings for the fences. And of course, people like that get some remarkable results and sometimes they get some quick failure. And I haven't the faintest idea how Elon Musk is gonna turn out, but I think he's got a considerable chance of success and a considerable chance of failure. He seems to like it that way. You have gotten into the tech world with buying Apple. Um, you have Mr. Gates there. I'm just wondering why you've never bought Microsoft. Well, <laughs> in, the, in the earlier years, it's very clear it's, the answer is stupidity, but the... Uh, <laughs> well, it's part of theology that a late conversion is better than ever, and you've greatly improved yourself. is because we started it 50 years ago and we kept doing it. And, uh, and it worked very well, what we were doing together. And I hope it works further for some extended period of time. After all, I wouldn't want to lose one. <laughs> uh, Pepsi's right in your wheelhouse. I think uh, the, the, the way the company's run, the, the products that it has. I, I, are you precluded for, in some kind of antitrust from owning both? Or? No, no I, no, I don't think the government would come after me. Uh, it, Pepsi, uh, it, it, it's a wonderful company, and, and particularly, I mean, Frito-Lay is a, a, a fabulous business. I'd love to own it. I, I, uh, I eat Fritos, I eat Cheetos, I eat their potato chips. I even meet Munchos, which are kind of hard to find, but I always drink Coca-Cola with them. <laughs> you know, Warren, I read your book, uh, the biography on you, and it said that you started life drinking Pepsi and those were the most joyful moments in your life. I love that. I think that's what keeps you so youthful because Pepsi is about <laughs> youthful cultures. Well, I have, to, I have to say, Andrew, that I started drinking Pepsi when I was about six or seven years of age in the 30s. And if you remember at that time, it was twice as much for a nickel too. Pepsi gave you 12 ounces mm -hmm. for a nickel and Coke, Coke gave you six and a half ounces. So I would definitely say that, that at half the price, it, 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 Pepsi was a good buy at that time. <laughs> Marked down 50%. <laughs> and, Warren, let me assure you, at any price, Pepsi is a great product. So, and Warren, you know what? Just as you talked about eating Cheetos and Fritos and uh, uh, Lay's potato chips, wait, wait, wait. I hope I can get you on TV one day to say you uh, drank one of our Pepsi products and loved it. <laughs> well, I I will probably uh, I will eat some Cheetos and Fritos today, but I I, uh, I will I will also drink five cokes. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, that, Joe, right. if you came to our laboratories, you'd be like a kid in a candy store. It's mm, true. I it, assure you. It, it, it's true. Come we've got we've got a real candy. First. Joe, we've got a real candy store for you. at C's Candy. So <laughs> I love don't, you. Too. Don't settle for anything except C's Candy. <laughs> I love you too. Fight over me. I can yeah. come. To, I have time. I can come to C's and to uh, and to Frito Land. There should be a theme park. Yeah, for, we'll, for we'll, me. we'll fly you back. <laughs> we'll fly you back and forth in a debt jet, too, uh, Joe. <laughs> and at the oh, end, there's a talking. doctor you know, waiting the, for you. And let me just uh, say one thing to Warren. Warren, Cheetos, Fritos, and Doritos taste fantastic and even better than, with Pepsi. Boy, this is uh, <laughs> uh, this is kind of a smackdown. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's, it is a smackdown. It's, it's a hard it, sell. Warren, it is too bad that Coke never, uh, you know, you do have to go out of the Coke family to get a snack. And I, I wonder why they didn't realize salty snacks drink salty I mean that's like I, peanut, I, that's I, like peanut butter and jelly that seems like a slam dunk to, to have thought of the thought of that in, Indra may know this better than I my my understanding is that Herman Lay went to coke I don't know 40 years ago or so and 
And uh, if a deal had been made, he would have owned more stock than Mr. Woodruff, and Mr. Woodruff didn't like it. But I, I don't know whether that's an old wives' tale or not. Andrew, do you know the answer on that? I, I think uh, the answer is that PepsiCo has always been strategically much better than anybody else out there. Oh, I love it. I like it. All right, we got to go. Ouch. That's a lot of things. Charlie? Yeah, we have a wonderful system. If one of us is stupid in some area, so is the other. But I would never be as good as he was. And everywhere I looked, there was somebody like that. And there was all this folly out there. And I suddenly realized, like, if I just avoid all the folly, you know, maybe I can get an advantage without having to be really good at anything. And I kept <laughs> doing that all my life. And it worked so well. I One of your other board members, Bill Gates. He's blogging now. Did you see he's got he's got a blog out there, Gates Notes. You know, you always I, say that you're a... I've you, taught that guy everything he knows about, <laughs> about, about computers and all that. I, I'm glad he's finally <laughs> picked up on it. <laughs> Warren has come out with his news about the prostate cancer. What was your reaction? Well, I regard it as a total non-event. I would bet a lot of money that I have more than he does. Do you think that Donald Trump is a good businessman? Because you certainly went after him on his business record. He had some major failures and, and he was very good at licensing and he was very good at, at things that involved promotion of his name. Uh, actual operation of the businesses in the 1980s and 1990s, you know, it left him essentially uh, bankrupting you know, multiple companies. But he, I would say he understands business, uh, but his record has been better at licensing and and uh, then then operation. putting out his own capital. Yeah. Are you concerned about his ability to operate big businesses? Well, he isn't going to be operating a business. We operate. I don't have to worry about him running a business at all. <laughs> He's the one that has to, uh, you know, that, that's, that, that doesn't really, in my judgment, uh, determine whether somebody makes a great president. Mm -hmm. Harry Truman went broke in a haberdashery store you know, <laughs> near Kansas City or in Kansas City. I mean, he wasn't much of a businessman. He turned out to be a terrific president. Part of the Berkshire secret is that when there's nothing to do, Warren is very good at doing nothing. <laughs> understands. It will come to a bad ending, Charlie. Well, I like cryptocurrencies a lot less than you do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, to me, it's just dementia. And I think the people who are professional traders they go into trading cryptocurrencies, it, it's, it's just disgusting. It's like somebody else is trading turds and you decide I can't be left out. <laughs> to the extent that this brought, we're being webcast around the world, I hope some of our stuff doesn't translate very well. <laughs> I think gold is a great thing to sew into your garments if you're a Jewish family in Vienna in 1939, but mm. I think civilized people don't buy gold. They invest in productive businesses. My dad was a Republican congressman and he thought if the Democrats won that there would never be another election. I mean, all my life I've heard all these terrible things are going to happen. If you went back far enough, you would find a lot of sin. My favorite saying was about Jay Gould and, and Russell Sage. And uh, you remember that era, and they said of those two in Congress, when they're talking, they're lying, and when they're quiet, they're stealing. When I was at the University of Nebraska, one day I was reading the Daily Nebraskan, and it said in room 300 or something, at 3 o'clock there will be this panel of three uh, uh, professors here at the university, and they're going to award the Nathan Gold Scholarship. I don't know whether you still, do you still have that around? And at the time, uh, it said it would give you $500 to go to the graduate school of your choice. I don't know whether it's changed in amount, but, but that, that was it. So I read this, and I went there to this room at 3 o'clock that day, or whatever it was, and I walked in the room, and there were the professors, and I was the only student that showed up. I mean, it really got to them. I mean, they, they were stuck. They, they, you know, they kept waiting and looking at their watch and hoping there'd be more candidates, but there, no one came in. So I won $500 by, by default. And uh, <laughs> now those are usually my biggest triumphs when nobody else shows up. Uh, <laughs> Years ago, 
one of our local investment counseling shops, a very big one. Just they were looking for a way to get an advantage over other investment counseling shops. And they reasoned as follows. We've got all these brilliant young people from Horton and Harvard and so forth, and they work so hard trying to understand business and market trends and everything else. And if we just ask each one of our most brilliant men for their single best idea, then created a formula with this collection of best ideas, we would outperform averages by a big amount. And that seemed plausible to them because they were ill-educated. That's what happens when you go to Harvard and Wharton. And, <laughs> and, and so they tried it out, and of course it failed utterly. So they tried it again, and it failed utterly, and they tried it a third time, and it also failed. Now, at a place like Berkshire Hathaway, we've done better than average. Why has that happened? And the answer is pretty simple. We tried to do less. We never had the illusion we could just hire a bunch of bright young people, and they would know more than anybody about canned soup and aerospace and utilities and so on and so on and so on. We never had that dream. We never thought we could get really useful information on all subjects, like Jen Kramer pretends to tends to have. <laughs> and Elon says a conventional moat is quaint, and that's true of a puddle of water. And he says that the best moat would be to have a big competitive position, and that is also right. You know, it's, a, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Warren does not intend to build an actual moat. <laughs> even though they're quaint. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of social scientists, scientists have a weird mania where they twist everything into whatever little concept they started with. Again, it's that old saying, to a man with a hammer, every problem looks pretty much like a nail. And <laughs> when I was right. Of course, I, I, I actually plan to keep managing Berkshire after I die. You have to understand that. <laughs> I, I have given all the managers Ouija boards, you know, and I've, <laughs> I've got these dark rooms they're going to go into, and I'll be there. <laughs> Mrs. B at, at the Nebraska Furniture Park worked till 103 at Berkshire, and she's, she's sort of our example. And, and then she, then she uh, took off from work, and she died the next year, so it's very dangerous to, to uh, <laughs> quit as early as that. <laughs> that. That does not mean we approve of every buyback at all, though. I mean, we've seen, no, no, no. Yeah. I think some people just buy it to keep the stock up, and that, of course, is insane and immoral. But apart from that, it's fine. <laughs> there are a lot of rich people out there, uh, Mr. Sure. Uh, who have the will, who have the intent to give money. Right. Uh, but somewhere they fall short of taking the final plunge. What would be your message to them? Well, from? my message to them, if they found some way to take it with them, I wish they'd tell me the secret, but the stars aren't as cheap as they've been most of the time. Yeah, it was, it was shooting fish in a barrel in late 2008 and 2009, and stocks have been steadily going up, pretty steadily going up now for, uh, well, March of 2009 was the low, <laughs> early in March. Uh, so it's, it's eight plus years. Stocks aren't going to earn much more, uh, they're not going to earn more just because you pay more for them. <laughs> A hundred billion dollars is a lot of money. I used to think so. Uh, <laughs> Generally speaking, when you get multicultural, you can also be multidisciplinary. But generally, I think people make more money if they're, if they're very narrowly specialized, like the pro proctologist. And, uh, and that it's much harder to make a, a lot of money for most people if you try and imitate Warren and me. I'm glad I didn't meet him earlier. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Warren headed. Buffett keeps screaming to be taxed more. Yeah, well, he should just write a check and shut up. <laughs> Really, and just contribute, okay? I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is that I'm tired of hearing about it. He's not the only person who feels that way. No. We've got a lot of viewer email that came in. We've been sitting down and doing this Ask mm -hmm. Warren session here for, I guess, the last four years yeah. or so. 
And this year, more than any other year, there were a lot of emails that came in that, that similarly echoed what Chris Christie had to say. What well, I hope they were a little more eloquent than that. But the, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's sort of a touching response to a $1.2 trillion deficit, isn't it? That somehow the American people will just all send in checks and take care of it. That was first come up with, first fellow come up with that was Senator McConnell. And, and I, I really, uh, I, I, uh, it's sort of astounding to me that somebody that has the responsibility for being the minority leader in the Senate would think that that you attack a 1.2 trillion dollar or so deficit by asking for voluntary contributions. Uh, since he did, I offered to triple his, but that, that's a that's a side. The, the corporate acquisition game now is so driven by the by the leveraged buyout and the so-called what do they call them strategic yes. Strategic. Uh, I, I usually translate that into barnyard language. And <laughs> hmm? have we ever made a deal that we would have regarded as strategic? We've never had a strategic plan unless you've hidden it from me. <laughs> Joe. I appreciate that one. When you get to be 87, people stand and applaud at the start because they're not sure whether you're going to be around at the end. It's, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Warren. He's Charlie. Charlie does uh, most things better than I do, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, this one's a little tough. <laughs> Charlie, maybe you can chew on that a while. Okay. <laughs> Have you considered overnight Elon Musk getting into the candy business as he suggested he might do on Twitter? I didn't hear that. It sounds like wise assery. <laughs> <laughs> I can't criticize anybody else for wise assery. And this man has this wonderful horse. And it's just a marvelous horse. It's got an easy gait. And good looking and everything, it just works wonderfully. But also occasionally just gets so he's dangerous and vicious and causes enormous damage and trouble and breaks arms and legs for his rider and so on. And he goes to the vet and say, what can I do about this horse? And the vet says, that's a very easy problem and I'm glad to help you. He says, what should I do? And the man says, the next time your horse is behaving well, sell it. <laughs> Well, think of how immoral that is. Yeah. And haven't I just described what private equity has to do? <laughs> when private equity has to sell something that's really troublesome, they hire an investment banker. And what does the investment banker do? He makes a projection. <laughs> you can't, I, I have never seen such expertise in my whole life as is created in making projections in investment banking. There is no business so lousy it can't get a wonderful projection. <laughs> and, but is that a great way to make a living, to have phony projections and use it to make money out of people you look right into the eyes of? I would say no. It's related to the precision uh, acquisition, so uh, whatever you see, you can add about 400. Um, million that, in my view, is not an economic expense, but but the accountants uh, would argue otherwise. Uh, uh, but it's our money, so we'll take my view. The, uh, <laughs> it sort of reminds me of, who was it, T Tony O'Reilly remarked one time about the uh, responsibility of a CEO that the very first job of the CEO was to search through his organization and find that person who had the initiative and the brains, the determination, all of the qualities to be his logical successor, and then fire the guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have a very peculiar place where the where Warren's contact with the various people elsewhere in the organization 
largely depends on what they want, not what he wants. And I have disciplined myself. And I now regard all politicians higher than I used to. I did that as a matter of self-preservation. The other thing I did to make me feel better about the current scene is I reread The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And it goes on for a great many hundreds of pages. And that made me feel a lot better about the current political scene. That's a pretty low bar. Well, I didn't. It's very helpful. I suggest you try it. You will feel better about the present world if you look at that one. If we were, we never would do it. But if we were to sell half, we'll say, of the BNSF Railroad, we would, we would receive more than we carry it. Carry it for them, we would turn it, we could turn it into a marketable security, and, and it would look like we made a ton of money overnight, or if we were to praise it, you know, praise it every three months and write it up and down. It, a, it would, could lead to all kinds of manipulation, but B, it would just lead to the average to any investor uh, being totally confused. I don't want to receive that in that manner, and therefore I don't want to send it out in that manner. So, Charlie? Well, to me it's obvious that the change in valuation should be noted, and it is and always has been, it goes right into the net worth figures. So the questioner doesn't understand his own profession. <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk that way, but it slips out once in a while. Sometimes he even gives it a push. <laughs> there is some precedent for success in this public service activity. If you go back many decades, John D. Rockefeller I, using his own money, made an enormous improvement in American medical care perfectly enormous. In fact, there's never been any similar improvement done by any one man since that marvels it. So Warren, having imitated Rockefeller in one way, is just trying another, and maybe it'll work. Rockefeller, incidentally, lived a very long time, so I actually am trying to imitate him in three ways there. <laughs> Remember the old saying, this too will pass? They all go away. I have a different rule about politicians. They are never so bad, you don't live to want them back. There will come a time when those people who hate Trump will wish that he were back. I don't think I'll live to see it, but I confidently predict that it will happen. I would, love to be a, I would love to be a baby being born in the United States today. Charlie, okay, Charlie, you give the other side of this. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there's a tendency to think that our present politicians are much worse than any we had in the past. But we tend to forget how awful our politicians were in the past. I can, I can remember a prominent senator arguing with an absolute earnestness that mediocre people ought to have more representation on the United States Supreme Court. Yeah, he came from Nebraska. He, he, did, he came from Nebraska. <laughs> I always liked the story of P.J. O'Rourke, who said, you know, he says, the last communist dictator of Albania was a pure communist. And he finally threw out the Russian embassy because they'd lost the pure faith. And then he kicked out the Chinese communists because they'd lost the pure faith. And he said, finally, he was only comfortable with two places in the world. One was the communist dictator of North Korea, and the other was the English department at Yale. <laughs> well, you think I'm kidding, but, but there is a lot of extreme craziness in some of the liberal arts, and they select people who share their craziness. We have over 150,000 people now working for Berkshire Hathaway in dozens of companies uh, throughout this country primarily and even abroad a little bit. We have exactly 15.8 people in headquarters, and Deb Ray came down with me today, so we've only got 13.8 uh, there the, today. And we're probably working just as well with those 13.8 as we would if Deb and I were in the office. But uh, I'm researching what makes partnerships successful, such as um, you and Warren. And in particular, I'm 
researching um, personality psychology. Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts are on that, if you have any. Thank you. Well, yes, I'll tell you what makes a partnership successful. Two talented people <laughs> working <laughs> well together. Of course that works better. My friend Garrett Hardin, wonderful man, another Caltech trained man, he used to say, if Aristotle were alive, he would be a very grumpy old man. Because <laughs> he would have seen the same damn mistakes made over and over and over again. And that may be some of the problem with me. <laughs> and in terms of uh, humility, I've frequently said that when they passed that out, I didn't get my full share. <laughs> and that was a serious problem when I was young. And I only cured it partly by becoming very rich. <laughs> <laughs> and generous. It takes both to overcome a defect like that. So the young people in the room, don't copy this if you're not willing to pay the price. There are a lot of rich people out there, uh, Mr. Sure. Prophet. Uh, who have the will, who have the intent to give money. Right. Uh, but somewhere they fall short of taking the final plunge. What would be your message to them? Well, I can't give you a formulaic approach because I don't use one. And I just mix all, I just mix all the factors and, and if the gap between value and, and prices not attractive, I'd go on to something else. And sometimes it's just quantitative. For instance, when Costco was selling at about 12 or 13 times earnings, I thought that was a ridiculously low value just because the competitive strength of the business was so great and it was so likely to keep doing better and better. But I can't reduce that to a formula for you. Uh, I like the cheap real estate. I like the competitive position. I liked the, the way the personnel system worked. I, I liked everything about it. And I thought, even though it's three times book or whatever it was then, uh, that it, it, it's worth more. But that's not a formula that anybody, if you want a formula, you should go back to graduate school. They'll, they'll give you lots of formulas that won't work. This is the longest we've ever gone in the Berkshire meeting without Charlie saying that getting to the point where he prefers Costco to Berkshire. <laughs> <laughs> and American Express made a decision a few years ago uh, not to uh, bid as low as somebody else did to retain the Costco business. And I think Charlie and I disagree on this, but I think it was a smart decision. He doesn't think it was a smart decision, but one of us will be right. And, and one of us will remind you that they were right. <laughs> Mr. Buffett, my name is Daphne Collier Starr. I'm eight years old and live in New York City. I've been a shareholder for two years, and this is my second annual shareholders meeting. Berkshire Hathaway's best investments on which the company built its reputation have been in very capital efficient businesses, such as Coke, Seize Candy, American Express, and Geico. But recently, Berkshire has made really big investments in a few businesses that require huge capital investments to maintain and that offer only a regulated low rate of return, such as Burlington Northern Railroad. My question to you, Mr. Buffett, is could you please explain why Berkshire's largest recent inv investments have been departed from your old capital efficient philosophy? 
And why specifically have you invested Burlington Northern instead of buying a capital efficient company like American Express? <laughs> You're killing me, Daphne. <laughs> yeah. I'm certainly glad she's not nine years old. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just sitting here thinking which of the six panelists we're going to bump next year and put you in. <laughs> uh, well, I thought I was doing well when I bought that city service at 11. <laughs> I like the aspiration of that young lady. She basically wants a royalty on the other fellow's sales. And of course, that's a very good model. And if everybody could do that way, nobody would do anything else. You definitely have a job in our capital allocation department. <laughs> Charlie? Yeah, it's a wonderful business because it's so difficult to do that competitors don't want to try it. When I lived in Omaha, there was a man who lived in great prosperity and almost no work, and his business was gathering up and rendering dead horses. And he never had any competitors. <laughs> he used to come up to the Omaha Club and start drinking about 11 in the morning. It was not a difficult business, but nobody ever crowded him with new competition. And very few people want to distribute zillions of electronic parts that are worth a nickel each. It's very complicated. And of course, that business is terribly good at it and it keeps getting more and more of the same. So you're right, it's a huge growth business, which is sort of the electronic equivalent of gathering up and rendering dead horses. Charlie made a, made a, uh profession of studying businesses where the owners could sit around and drink all day and have them. <laughs> you, know, you know, that was where we ought to be competing but, uh, or buying. My theory, Warren, is if it, if it can't stand a little mismanagement, it's no business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and we're testing that sometimes. <laughs> I finally figured out why the teachers of corporate finance often teach a lot of stuff that's wrong. When I had some eye, eye troubles very early in life, I consulted a very famous eye doctor. And I realized that his place of business was doing a totally obsolete cataract operation. They were still cutting with a knife after better procedures had been invented. And I said, why are you in a great medical school performing absolute obsolete operations? He said, Charlie, it's such a wonderful operation to teach. <laughs> well, that's what happens in corporate finance. They get these formulas, and it's a fine teaching experience. You give them a formula, you present the problem, they use the formula. It's, you get a real feeling of worthwhile activity. You know, there's only one trouble, it's all balderdash. Yeah, whenever you hear a theory described as elegant, watch out, you know, right. right. This is one, what's a good indicator of when to sell in an emerging well, market? Well, you know, if you know the business well, and you think the business has a wonderful future, it's be better to be very slow about selling. I mean, if you're, in a, if you're in a wonderful business, if you're in a wonderful marriage, you don't want to think too much about <laughs> changing a partner. You no, just, not absolutely you just, not. But you, Good morning, my name is Matthew Peterson. Because why shouldn't you be happy in spite of the fact that the civilization wasn't quite as easy as it was for my generation? And now beyond that, when it gets more difficult, how should you do it? Well, the answer is because it's going to be very difficult, you should work at it. And if all that gets you is 6% for a lifetime of work instead of 5 you should be cheerful about it. If you want to hit it out of the park easily, you should talk to Jim Cramer. <laughs> I'm impressed when machines beat goal or something of the sort, or, or even win the chess or whatever it may be. I don't really think they bring much to the table in terms of 
capital allocation or investing. And then I may be missing something entirely, you know, maybe I'm just blind to what's out there. You're missing a lot of very remunerative fee earning twaddle. Yeah, well. <laughs> and I see an artificial speculative medium that people are buying just because they think they can sell to somebody else at a higher price, even though it inherently has no intrinsic value. And so I regard the whole business as antisocial, stupid, immoral. Immoral? Yes, Why immoral. Is that? Why? Why would you trade? Suppose you could make a lot of money trading freshly harvested baby brains. How many people of our age quickly mastered Google? I've been to Google headquarters. They look to me like they're, it looks like a kindergarten. <laughs> a very rich kindergarten. Yes. <laughs> Testing, one million, two million, three million, that's yeah, working, okay. I would like to know what's your favorite industry and why it's your favorite industry. My favorite industry, well, my favorite industry is taking care of my own affairs. <laughs> and so the the top five AIDS, TB, malaria, and those two childhood uh, causes, uh, we're making great progress there. The other fifteen, like visceral leishmaniasis, yes. are less known because they're only in the and less pronounceable areas. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but he's going to be my family doctor, Charlie. I can see that. This guy is. He's got it. Yeah, I want him. In, I want him in the operating room. But you told me uh, something the other day about sales of underwear that I found very interesting. No. T well, t I think this audience would love it. I, I I use it as a conversation starter every place. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, some, some years ago, my partner, Charlie Munger, is six years older, and I said, you know, Warren, he said, we've got to get into, start getting into women's underwear, <laughs> now or never, you know, so we bought Fruit of the Loom. I mean, it was the only, <laughs> it was the all, all, only alternative we had. And uh, uh, Now, I, if I move out to Palm Springs or something like that, I may have great neighbors, too. I'll probably never know them. I mean, uh, in my zip code, there are over 100 shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway, you know. I'm with friends as long as the stock's up anyway. <laughs> but, but yeah. I mean, Probably gonna when, take you, you to when you've got 100 now. shareholders in your zip code, I mean, when you go out trick-or-treating, you do all right. I mean. <laughs> That's good. The ideal way to run a headquarters is to have one man, preferably over 80, sitting in an office by himself. Anything else is pure frippery. You, you mentioned Charlie Munker. Yeah. Uh, you called him up and said, I'm thinking about doing this. What yeah. was his reaction? He says you finally had a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for that for years. <laughs> you, really? yeah, you made your first bet, your first official bet of your life, because I think what you do normally is not betting. It's, right. it's, it's informed decision making. So you, tell us about it. Nebraska. Who were they playing? They were playing Fresno State. And yeah, normally I like to be the house. Yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, Warren's going to turn 80 in August. Happy birthday in advance. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Charlie. Maybe may the only time to give it to me. <laughs> Char Today, this very day, in Central Park, went for a walk because it's just a, such a sunny, spectacular day. And I was stopping just at the little lake there, and a couple went, walked by. And I, I'm not making this up. And the woman said to the man, that Warren Buffett is so cute. <laughs> like, a summer's day, the sunny heat, a woman says to her husband, Warren Buffett's cute. And I'm thinking, he's smart, he's wise, he's funny. What's the cute thing? <laughs> And, you know, I know that people, you know, with, with billions of dollars are supposed to become much more attractive, but he's given all his away. <laughs> What's a rock star to do? Must be out of my mind to try and follow that. <laughs> <laughs> he, made a, uh, he made a great choice in picking Bono to introduce me, but if you don't mind, next time, 
Get that lady in Central Park to go. <laughs> If you take all of the gold in the world that's ever been produced, it comes to about 165,000 metric tons. Uh, some people get excited just talking about that sort of thing. The, uh, but if you put that all together in a cube, would I rather have that cube, 67 feet on each side of gold, or would I rather have all the farmland in the United States plus seven Exxon Mobiles plus a trillion dollars to stick in my pocket? I think that's kind of an easy decision, but people like gold. When they get, a, when they get afraid of money, uh, uh, terrified of money, they, they run to gold, and then they hope somebody will pay, pay more for it next year, because it isn't going to produce anything. That cube is just going to sit there and stare at you, you know, and you can, you, you, can, you can go, if you own it, you can go and you can fondle it, you know, and you can sit on top of it and do whatever makes you feel good, but it isn't going to deliver anything to you. We look for three qualities. We look for integrity, we look for intelligence, and we look for energy. But if they don't have the first one, integrity, the other two will kill you. Because if you're hiring somebody without integrity, you really want them to be dumb and lazy, don't you? I mean, you know, the last thing in the world you want for them is to be smart and energetic. So. Don't you think that it's the right of the board members to be able to say, Warren, why are you buying ConocoPhillips when oil is $147 a barrel? I wish you had. <laughs> <laughs> the truth of the matter is that not everybody can learn everything. Some people are way the hell better. And of course, no matter how hard you try, there's always some guy that achieves more. Some guy or gal. And the answer is, so what? Do it. Does any of us need to be the very top of the whole world? It's ridiculous. And another thing that people do like Bear Guard is amazing is they build these enormous mausoleums. I think they figure they want people to walk by that mausoleum and say, gosh, I wish I were in there. <laughs> I'm the young one. Uh, you may notice in the movie, incidentally, that Charlie is always the one that gets the girl. And he has one explanation for that, but I think mine is more accurate that, as you know, every mother in this country tells her daughter at an early age, if you're choosing between two very old and very rich guys, pick the one that's older. <laughs> <laughs> and the best business we had was the pinball machine business, which was the Wilson coin operated machine company, and that was named after the high school my partner and I went to. We had our machines in barber shops, and the barbers always wanted to put us in machines with flippers, which were just coming in. But those machines cost 350 bucks, whereas an old obsolete machine cost 25 bucks. We always told them we'd take it up with Mr. Wilson, this mythical Mr. Wilson. He was one tough guy, I got to tell you. <laughs> You know, when I was 16, I, I was only thinking about two things, cars and girls. You know, I wasn't very good with girls, so I just kind of narrowed it down a little bit. But, uh, uh, although if you had the right car, it helped with girls, too. I mean, That's true. <laughs> That's Charlie, I'm Warren. <laughs> you can tell us apart because uh, he can hear and I can see. That's why we uh, <laughs> work together so well. We each have our specialty. Uh,
had lunch here earlier today. It was very good and it wasn't that expensive, and uh, I quite enjoyed it. A lot cheaper than New York and Washington. Not a lot. That's why I buy, I buy people lunch here, and then they could buy me the lunch in New York. That's well, a good deal. Warren has said we only have 250 derivatives contracts. It's about 63 billion in the grand scheme of things. It's not that many. Charlie Ute said, I see no social constructive advantage to any of this. People on the other side of the map like Joan of Arc, they are not Joan of Arc. No, I said they were like Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> Long term, I'm a, a little less afraid of the crazies in the Republican Party than I am of Why? the crazies in the Democratic Why? Party. Why is that? Because they're not going to win. Nobody's going to take the, significant rights he, away from women or eliminate the ability of women to get abortions. None of that can possibly happen. So these crazies are not going to succeed. But conversely? The Democrats might succeed in some of the crazy things they want to do. And what would happen then? Well, it wouldn't be good. We had a, we had a, we had a survival war for the economy going on. How, how does this work for, you know, so all of us, like, you know, so it's 2008, the world is melting down. Does like President Bush or Obama, or I guess at, at that time Bush or Gardner, they call, and you're getting calls in Omaha, is it ringing off the hook? Like what's going on in your office in Omaha? Well, people that are looking so, for money call. Okay. <laughs> just, just, just like, yeah. hey, hey, Warren, yeah. the country's yeah. going down. I was my favorite guy in Omaha. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and your, assi yeah. your assistant. Uh, I started looking like George Clooney, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Warren got his first wife by playing the ukulele. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a very important instrument to him. I was willing to spend 30 bucks on the whole thing. I, mean, I spent about, spent about 12 hours, at least 12 hours a week playing bridge on the internet. I play on something called OK Bridge most of the time. My name is T-Bone. Uh, <laughs> um, but these guys think like young whippersnappers who are at the height of their game. Absolutely. I, staying around them invigorates me, helps me learn new things. I, uh, I love their youthful attitude. Well, we have a lot of fun. I like your attitude, Bill, and I'll be very happy when you're gone. I'm happy when you're gone. <laughs> I was at the MGM for the Floyd Mayweather fight, and I was walking by the sports book, and it said 12 and a half points, Nebraska, Fresno State. And... Uh, I like to buy mispriced things, and uh, when I made the bet, there were a bunch of guys came over, and you remember that movie where Meg Ryan says, I'll have what she's having, you know? Well, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah, well, it, it wasn't quite as much fun as that, but... Uh, <laughs> so. I always want to sleep well, and so I always want to have way more cash than we could possibly need under any circumstances. If you call me tomorrow with some deal that requires more money than we have available, that, that would leave me with cash below a comfort level, I've got two choices to say no to you uh, or to sell, sell something. And, 
and that may depend on the circumstances and you know, whether I think I can get those sold and all of that. But I, I am not going to leave a Berkshire ever uncomfortable in respect to cash. Now we had 24 billion a year, and as you may have noticed, and. The truth is, even though I say $10 billion is the minimum, I don't want to get close to that. <laughs> I, I, I don't ever want to depend on, on the kindness of strangers or, or for that matter, <laughs> the kindness of banks. <laughs> <laughs>
tax named after you. And I said, well, if, if all the diseases have been taken away, why shouldn't I? I'll, I'll take a tax. So, and so. Now, when you were a young boy, you, you were addicted, I was told, to Pepsi. How did you switch to Coke? Well, I, I would like to say, of course, that I, I just finally grew up and understood. When I was a kid, Pepsi was 12 ounces for a nickel, and Coke was six and a half ounces for a nickel. And if you have any insights into my personality, you'll know which I bought. <laughs> I just spoke with Warren about this situation in Europe, and he's concerned, but not overly concerned. Um, you've said recently that European leaders were, quote, shooting at an elephant with a pea shooter. Yeah. Um, what, what's your concern? I, they did that for years. Even our most reputable, reputable part of finance has dirty, sleazy activities creeping in, and it will ever be thus. Large amounts of easy money cause regrettable human behavior. Smongers rule. <laughs> Well, so now, if you need if you need to carry something out to four decimal places, forget it. <laughs> well, generally, I've avoided circumstances which automatically cause reasonable fear. Now, if you want to go hang gliding, you have to select one partner. <laughs> <laughs> My son Philip is in the audience. He had a saying when he was young. He'd say, "If at first you don't succeed, well, so much for hang gliding." <laughs> <laughs> Successful proprietary traders get more and more power and are allowed to use more and more leverage year after year. Will cause blow-ups from time to time that are terrible for the rest of us. Why on earth should we allow this? Well, the guys on Wall Street are fighting fiercely against this. Of course, us. they're like a diver when you step on the air hose. Of course, they don't want <laughs> anybody to take away their air hose. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> It's a particularly good air hose because not only do they make money, but they can t report that they're making more money than they really are. Well, that's a lovely combination. What's your general impression after three days in Europe? Well, my first impression is that um, Europe has a lot of journalists. The <laughs> <laughs> board of directors, Bill Gates is here. He's on the board, and and I've I've carried this envelope around that has the name inside and. Bill slipped it out one time and opened it up and read it to the board. It says, check my pulse again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I bought the board, all of Ouija boards, to stay in contact with me, too. <laughs> of course.